Tradesmen look at buildings differently, depending on the trade they represent. You'll find the carpenter casting an eye on the woodwork, the bricklayer looking at the brickwork, and the painter finds his gaze shifting to the walls and the ceilings. Likewise, the greater a person's perception of Allah's names, the greater his alertness, understanding of life's swings and roundabouts. Nothing passes them without thought. Everything becomes a trigger for deep contemplation. When they see a display of mercy, they automatically and naturally reflect on the names of Allah Ar-Rahim, the most merciful, ar rauf the pitying, Al-Wadud, the affectionate. When they sense might and awe in any turn of life, they're overcome with the names Al-Jabbar, the Kumpela, Al-Muntaqim, the Avenger, Al-Qahar, the Subduer, Al-Aziz, the Mighty. Eventually, they reach a station where every scene that unfolds, any sin which presents itself to them, or any opportunity that drifts, generates the remembrance of Allah Almighty in their life and a retreat to Him. And it's achieving that exact goal is precisely the objective of this series. I don't think it would be an exaggeration in any way to make the claim that the universe in its enormity was created with the intention for us to realize the names and attributes of Allah. Allah Almighty said, Allahu alladhi khalaqa sab'a samawatin wa min al-ardi mithlahun. It is Allah who created seven heavens and of the earth the like of them. Yatanazzalu al-amru baynahun. His command descends between them. Why was all of this created? Listen to the second part of the ayah. He said, لِتَعْلَمُوا So that you may know أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ That Allah is most capable of everything. وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ أَحَاطَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عِلْمًا And that Allah has encompassed all things in knowledge. It's as if he is saying that this wondrous and formidable structure around you was put there so that you look at it and realize that Allah exists and that Allah is capable and that Allah has encompassed all things in knowledge to know His names and His attributes. Qiwamu Sunnah al-Asbahani, he said that if a person wants to accept someone's offer for marriage or offer himself for marriage or wants to deal with a person in any way, he would first request his name, his nickname, family name, and would ask about both the important and unimportant matters. And then he said, so Allah who created us and provided for us, the one whom we hope for his mercy and fear his punishment, is worthy of us knowing his names and understanding them. And your Iman is closely linked to your level of knowledge of Allah. And seeing that you and I will never see Allah in the life of this world, we're left with the names of Allah and their effects that can be seen and felt around us today. So we can conclude that one of the greatest ways of fostering Iman to levels where you can almost taste it is by way of contemplating the names of Allah and noticing their effects in life and their signs and their signatures in the universe and within your very self. And this is because love has causes. One of them is Jamal, beauty. Beautiful matters by virtue of their splendor, they're loved. The heart has a natural affinity towards all of those things that are pleasing to the eye. And since all beauty in existence is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can ask the question, who is more beautiful than him? And of course, the true answer to this question will only be realized on the day when the veil between Allah and His righteous servants is finally removed, when their eyes will gape and their minds will wander in awe. And as for the second cause of love after Jamal, beauty is ihsan, good treatment. Those who bring benefit to people and treat them well are loved. As for the favors of Allah upon man, subhanAllah, they predate His existence. Allah provided him all what he needed 
from within the womb of his mother. He then releases him into a world that has already been fully furnished with all what he requires. It's all there. And that's why Prophet Ibrahim said, الَّذِي خَلَقَنِي فَهُوَ يَهْدِينَ He is the one who created me and guides me. وَالَّذِي هُوَ يُطْعِمُنِي وَيَسْقِينَ And it is he who feeds me and gives me drink. وَإِذَا مَرِضْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ And when I am ill, it is he who cures me. What about the favors of Allah? Allah's good treatment of his creation is such that your role in acquiring the things you need is only a minute phase in the middle. And as for the levels before it and the levels after it, they were taken care of entirely by Allah. Let me explain. When you make your way to buy bread, just remember that you weren't the one who brought down its rain and allowed it to seep into the soil, nor, nor were you the causer of its wheat to grow, nor were you the planter of those seeds, nor were you the harvester, nor were you the supplier of the grain to the companies, nor were you the grinder of those grains, nor the mixer of ingredients, nor the kneader of the dough, nor the baker of that bread, nor its packager, nor its seller. Your involvement was simply to pull it off the shelf in its ready baked format. Then after you swallow the food, again, you play no role in the phases after it. You didn't inspire the esophagus to push the food down to your stomach. You didn't inspire the mechanisms of preventing it from returning upwards. Nor were you involved in the process of enzyme release for digestion, nor in the churning of the stomach to break down the food, nor in the complex and harmonious processes which involve a tight coordination between the liver and gallbladder and the pancreas and other organs. You weren't involved in the eventual transfer of the molecules into the bloodstream. And then the proportional distribution of energy from that food to every part of the body. A portion goes to the nails, a portion for your hair, your face, your tears, your veins, your blood, the white of your eye, your sweat, your flesh, your nerves, your muscles, tendons, bones. Each gets a share. You didn't play anything, you didn't play any role in that. You didn't play a role in the excretion of what the body doesn't require from that bread. Your involvement is purely a short roll in the middle to take the bread off the shelf. Whilst all of the most difficult processes before it and after it, they don't involve you in the least. This is just one example pertaining to bread. What well, about the rest of Allah's favor? The apparent ones and the hidden ones, and both those that you're aware of and those that you're not, and even those that you will never know about. So when you look at both of these reasons for love, Jamal, beauty, and Ihsan, kindness, favors, you notice that they are captured perfectly by his names and his attributes. The deeper you explore them, the deeper you realize just how perfect and beautiful and infinitely kind Allah has always been. This in turn leads to the immediate rebuilding of Iman and the experience of the sweetness of Ibadah worship. But you see, not only does knowledge of Allah's names pull you closer to the doorstep of worship, it also pushes you farther away from sins. It's an amazing study. A man once found himself alone with an Arab Bedouin woman and he tried seducing her. She refused his invitation. She said to him, What is wrong with you? Where is your honor? Where is your religion? And he responded to her jokingly. He said, Why are you panicking? No one can see us but the planets. She said to him, Where is the one who put those planets in their place? Allahu Akbar. We're going to come across in the series many similar examples of this type of story because this is precisely the objective behind the choosing of this topic. That the next time a sin presents itself to you saying, here I am, no one is looking. We develop this ability to say, what about Allah? What about as samia the hearing, al-basir, the seeing? What about al-raqib, the observing? What about al-alim, the knowing? Al-Qadir, the capable. And I love the words of Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim, who summarizes the fruits of 
journeying through the names of Allah Almighty, he said, if a person ascends into the realm of realization, where he can almost see the perfect traits of Allah and his majestic descriptions, his soul will feel the special type of nearness where it will experience the removal of veils that stand between one's heart and soul and its Lord. That veil is the nafs, the self. And so if Allah allows that veil to be removed, his heart and soul will make their way to Allah, causing a person to worship Allah as though he could see him. So join us as we try to achieve just that in a series we've named A Life with Allah.